It Happened on the Mysterious Isle of Seacliff by Ian Gordon. 4. The Pier Pirate December 27th, 5 a.m. I have awoken to a plethora of strange sounds out in the night. I am sat by the window under the dim glow of a desk lamp, trying vainly to make out the Myriad shapes moving back and forth across the market square. It's extremely dark out there. The square is cloaked in shadow, and the sea beyond is merely a vast plain of illimitable blackness. But there they are, those lumpy forms, coming and going, muttering to one another. The things don't so much walk as crawl. And if I were to compare their deafness to something— it would be to that of a cast of crabs, furtively sidling to and from destinations unknown. I can't make their mutterings out, if the vocalizations are indeed words, just an incessant, high-pitched, insectile droning, as the nebulous bodies go about their strange, nocturnal duties. What on earth is going on down there? December 27th 8 a.m. At 7 a.m. sharp, I received a wake-up call in the form of a light tapping at my door. Donning my slippers, I opened the door, and was pleasantly surprised to find a freshly cooked breakfast waiting for me, comprising sausages, eggs, several rounds of toast, and a steaming cafetiere. The food was wonderful. Can't say I'm a huge fan of the coffee, though. It held an aniseed flavour that didn't sit too well with me. Either way, I'll be sure to thank Miss Black on my way out later. December 27th, 12.15 p.m. And so it continues. The strangeness, I mean. Shortly after 8.30, having dressed following a tepid shower, I made my way out into Redditch. I thanked Miss Black for the courtesy of breakfast— but refrained from commenting on the commotion I witnessed in the early hours. A proviso of keeping myself to myself was still at the forefront of my mind, and I had no desire to rock the boat with her. Crossing the market square in direction of the coast, whatever it was that had been shuffling across it in the night had left no evidence, I observed. The stalls and kiosks that had been filled with such a wonderful variety of foodstuffs the day before were still present— though now they were empty, their skeletal frames akin to macabre metal statues. I must add that the weather was fine at this point. Blue skies predominated. The air held a slight refreshing chill, for which I was grateful. The town was utterly devoid of activity. I observed a number of shops along the precinct—butcher, greengrocer, the little wool shop—all of which appeared to be open— though shoppers were nowhere to be seen. Reaching the promenade, which runs parallel north to south along Foreshore Road, I spent a few minutes admiring the long stretch of coast. Several artefacts strewn across the broad beach caught my eye. A shipwreck, or, should I say, boatwreck, due to its small size, a vast pile of whale-bones, and, most notably, a huge rock jutting out of the water to the south, a titanic monolith, highly reminiscent of Baalbek's stone of the pregnant woman, in both its overall appearance and the way in which it sloped vertically upwards from out of the sea. Gazing at that rock, I couldn't help but feel drawn to it, much like one who has travelled for many years yearns for a taste of home. Had I seen it in my dreams? stood upon it in my wildest nightmares? Catching sight of a group of youngsters to the north, I made a mental note to return to the rock, and set off towards them. The north end of the promenade is host to the old harbour, which, I have gathered from my research, once served Morton Leadmine. It comprises two inaccessible piers, the flat and empty East Pier, serving as the main breakwater, and Sandside Pier, 
host to a number of derelict buildings, including the remains of a lighthouse. The youngsters I'd spotted, three boys approximately twelve years of age, were standing by the chained-up entrance to Sandside Pier, their eyes glued to the back of what at one time, ostensibly, was a nautical museum or similar. This I deduced from the presence of multiple props and discarded display pieces to the rear of the building. I approached the boys, and, innocently enough, asked them what they were looking at. It was immediately obvious that the youngsters weren't quite as disconnected as their elders. They acknowledged my presence enthusiastically, whilst commenting amongst themselves, in hushed tones, on my evident exoticism. And then, in short order, the boys quickly turned my attention to one of the discarded props on the other side of the steel bars. The prop in question was an upright, life-size statue of a pirate, adorned in the expected attire, frock coat, tricorn, and cavalier boots, complete with a plastic cutlass. Its back was facing us, and it, in turn, was facing a large dark window, almost as though the still figure was peering inside. "'Why, exactly, are you spying on a plastic pirate?' I asked, to which the evident leader of the trio, the red-headed character whose buddies called him Moffat, informed me that the pirate was alive. Frowning, I took a seat by the heavy-looking gates, and listened to the tale as the boys claimed to have experienced it. Apparently, it had all started seven days earlier, when Moffat had been walking his dog, Hannibal, along the promenade, and happened to notice that old Blackbeard hadn't been in his usual position by the window. In fact, Blackbeard was nowhere to be seen. Puzzled by this turn of events, Moffat had reported the fact to Howie and Hodds, his two closest chums, and the three of them had returned to the pier late that same afternoon to investigate. Unfortunately for Moffat, Blackbeard had returned, and was observed by Howie and Hodds to be in precisely the same location he usually was. Moffat, dismissing the turn of events as a trick of the light, returned the following morning, dog in tow, to discover that the plastic pirate had moved again, though this time he hadn't disappeared. Blackbeard was present all right, only now his back was to the window, and his dead eyes were gazing absently in the direction of the chained-up gates. Spooked, Moffat once more sought the company of his two closest pals, and returned to Sandside Pier. Howie and Hodds were shocked to discover that their buddy hadn't been joking after all. Blackbeard had indeed moved, and even more shocked was Moffat, who now saw that the plastic pirate had crept forward further still. The figure's frame was now within spitting distance of the heavy gates, and its malleable arms were raised, as though in the act of reaching out to touch them. Rather than flee, as might have been the case should such a strange set of circumstances arisen on the mainland, these three boys, hardy and brazen, approached the rusty gates, and eyed the character on the other side with much deliberation. But there was no movement in the old statue. Blackbeard was frozen in place, just as he had always been, his lifeless eyes fixed on nothing in particular, glazed plastic orbs, unseeing, unaware. And there the figure remained for several days, static and mute, overlooked by other members of the community all of whom simply pass Sandside Pier without so much as a glance in the direction of the recently animated plastic pirate. Then it was Christmas Day, and the boys, obsessed with the strangeness occurring on the pier, had agreed to meet by the old gates at noon. The rain had been beating down, they said, when, with a great deal of hesitation, the three lads approached the derelict pier, and saw, much to their horror, Old Blackbeard behind the rusty bars, his peeling plastic hands clutching the chained-up handles, a look of fiery frustration painted across his sun-bleached face. It was then Moffat insisted that old Blackbeard was finally observed to move before their very eyes, to pull frantically at the metal bars, to snarl fiercely in a futile attempt to break free of his peer prison, to fill the hearts of the three youngsters with pure terror. They took off, 
never looking back. Yesterday, Boxing Day, coinciding with my arrival, the boys took the decision to avoid the pier, fearful of the consequences of the pirates' escape. But, as their present return to the harbour confirmed, the plastic pirate had failed in his attempts to escape, and, evidently, had returned to the position he had apparently occupied for over a decade. I'm not sure what to make of the boy's story. I know the look of sincerity when I see it, and those boys wore it unwaveringly. But can I really believe that inanimate objects have the potential to come to life here? Like dolls locked up in toy stores after closing time? Surely not. It's a bit of fun, that's all it is. A bit of fun at the expense of the newcomer. But as I sit here in my suite contemplating the tall tale, I have to wonder, what if the story of the plastic pirate is merely the tip of a much larger and much uglier iceberg? Thanks for listening today, folks. Join us again tomorrow for the next part.